Welcome. We're, uh, we're uh, going to continue our Bible study in 1 John. This is chapter 5, and we will be um, ending. Chapter 5 is it until the fall, and um, at that time I believe we might be back in a, into the fellowship hall for our Bible studies, live Bible studies. Um, probably going to break this up into three sections because it was rather long, and I don't want to keep them long. I'd rather you... Um, spend the quality time, and, and uh, I know a lot of people are busy, but this is a great, great to listen uh, to a, a, a Bible study, and it's even better to be there in person where you can open your Bible and ask questions, but we do what we do with what we have. So let me uh, open in prayer, and then we'll get started. Dear Lord, God, we ask you just to open up your word to us, Lord, and, and just uh, give me the words to say, and and just, Lord, just, uh, just bless this study. Bless, uh, uh, bless our outreach here at, at, uh, at Linwood Community Church. Lord, I thank you for our crew. I thank you for Tim and, 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 and Malcolm. And, you know, just to be able to come to church and have that be part of your life and not just part of a job. And to be able to sit and serve you and do, do the best we can and, with what you've given us, Lord, and we just thank you for the opportunity. Once again, Lord, just uh, open, open the ears of those that uh, want to listen to this, Lord. We ask that in your name. Amen. Okay, First John, this has been a, an amazing journey for me. Uh, to be really honest with you, the, the reason I picked First, you know, First John is I figured, you know, it's not that big a book, five chapters. Five chapters, five weeks, and I'm, I'm, I'm good. Now it's, it's, it's probably going to end up being more like 13 or 14 weeks, and, and it could have been longer. It's an amazing book, and I encourage you uh, to read it. And I encourage you to pick up a, 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 a commentary that, that will help you get through some of it and um, maybe send you back and forth to some verses that you can pick up and the Bible is an amazing tool for your life. And, you know, those of us who have had the opportunity to, to actually start studying it, um, my God, what a joy just to be able to open, crack open the book and learn, continue to learn. And I, I, it, it's, it amazes me when I talk to pastors who have been doing it for, for years, 30 years, 40 years, and them, them say that, yeah, you know, each, each message is new. Each message, you know, when I study it, 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 it hits me to where I am at that day and that time. And that's what the Bible does. It's our guide. It's our guide uh, for our life. So, John opens up five by introducing the victorious life in Christ. This victorious life can only be accomplished if you're a true Christian, not a Christian. I've asked many people, you know, what? You know, what religion are you? I mean, what faith are you? Well, I'm a Christian. Are you a Christian? Or are you a true Christian? There's a difference. Um, because true Christians, true Christians have uh, victory in Christ, in everything. And their life is tied up in Christ. It's not tied up in a, in a religious ceremony. It's tied up with the, the Son of God. It's tied up with his, the God's commandments. And it's tied up with his dying on the cross. And our accepting him as a personal Savior. True Christians. It, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. You have to have salvation to be a true Christian. And, and so hopefully after you get through all the first John, man, you get a good glimpse of what Christians do and what they shouldn't do, and what the evil one does, and how you should stay away from that. So, First John has a lot of, a lot of knowledge behind it. And uh, as you know, John was one of the original apostles. He walked with Jesus, touched him, felt him. He was real. So, victory, uh, a victorious life in Christ. Um, you can only have victory, though, if... You got to have a game, a contest, a war, 
uh, it's got to be something that you're victorious over. You got to win something. Um, and you know what? Vic victory and wars go together. I remember, remember watching this old black and white series called Victory at Sea, and it was all about the United States Navy in World War II. Um, and you know, the world has certainly seen its share, share of wars. After the fall in the garden, we've never had peace in this world. The Bible uses many terms to describe what Christians are. They are believers, friends, brothers, sheep, saints, soldiers, witnesses, etc., etc. There's many terms used, um, and by Jesus, that tell you what a Christian is, a true Christian. And you know what? In chapter 2, verse 13, John says, he's writing to the young Christians. Now remember going back to the... To, uh, one of the earlier Bible studies, it's talking about uh, the young Christians. And he's writing to them because they have overcome the evil one. So the word overcomer comes from Greek, the Greek word meaning uh, to conquer, to have victory, or to have superiority or conquering power. The word reflects genuine superiority that leads to overwhelming success. Jesus uses this word to refer to himself. So if we look back into uh, John, the Gospel of John 14, 30, 16.33, he uh, says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Of course, you know he is the overcomer. And the word overcomer is found 24 times in the New Testament. And John uses it 23 of those times. So faith is one of the characteristics of an overcomer. And John, a man named John Henry Yates, and he's a great story. If you ever want to read a, a really cool story, look him up. I'm not going to get into it. But he wrote a hymn, and it's called, entitled, Faith is the Victory. So I'm going to read the second verse, uh, and then the chorus. You can look up the rest if if you're interested, I'm not going to sing it to you because you'd probably plug your ears up as I was singing, so I'm not going to do that. It says, His banner over us is love. Our sword, the word of God. We read the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith, they like a whirlwind's breath swept o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. So faith is big. And, uh, and being an overcomer is the only way that we can have victory. So I write out of the New King James, and I want to read the first five verses uh, to you. It says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So verse 1 is just telling us simply that the center of our spiritual life is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God. And it's a simple statement, but that's our whole life is wrapped up into that statement. The center of our spiritual life needs to be Jesus Christ. So John tells us in verse 2 that we know we love God's children. How do we know that? If, here's that word, very small word, very big meaning, if. That means it's a choice. If we love God and obey his commandments. Because we know God commanded us to do what? 
love one another. Again, John's referring to our brothers and sisters in Christ here. And you stop and think about this. It's different when he says, love your enemies. You know, your, your testimony of Jesus Christ is love. But he's really talking about loving your brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters that are your church family. Uh, brothers and sisters that are Christians, true Christians. And, and there's reasons why he, he points that out. I mean, I, I can be honest with you. Do, you know, if I, do I love the guy that's got a gun pointed at, 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 at somebody's head and he's high on drugs and you know, everything else you could think of as negative? At that moment, can I say I love him? Oh, uh, I no. Well, what does God tell us to do? We love your enemies. So, even though it was a commandment, even though it was a commandment, um, it's a tough one. It's tough to do. But how do you love your enemies? You share Christ. You share Christ instead of sharing your anger and sharing. You share Christ. Let God do the work. Let the Holy Spirit speak to that person. And I think that's what he means by love your enemies. You love them enough, love them enough to share uh, eternity with Christ with them. And you don't know them. You might not know them. Or you might know them. Either way, they're probably somebody you don't like being around. That doesn't matter. But our Christian brothers and sisters, oh man, we should take care of each other um, because that's what God asks us to do. Verse 3 is clearly defining love for God as obedience, to being obedient to God. So we can't claim to love God and be indifferent to his commands. We can't say, I, yeah, I love God, I follow God, I follow everything, and I just don't really follow all the commandments uh, or things he asks me to do. I don't, but I still love him. Uh, that's a big no. You know, that's proof. Your life is proof of that. You know, whether you obey God or disobey God. Uh, because we love God, his commands are not burdensome, but liberating. So in Matthew 24, 3, where Jesus is speaking to the multitudes about the scribes and the Pharisees. Now remember, these guys aren't the good guys. Uh, Jesus is preaching, and he's on this earth to, to give us that opportunity uh, to be heaven bound. But these guys are still looking back and they just can't buy that this guy is the son of God. But he tells them, he says, hey, for about the Pharisees, he tells the people, hey, for they bind heavy, heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them one finger, one of their fingers to help. So what does that really mean? I mean, what is a burden? Um, when... Christ was preaching, and Christ was talking about heaven. Christ was talking about who he is, who his father was, the only way to get to heaven. The only, he, he's, he's laying it on these Pharisees and these scribes who think they know everything. And so they, they want to call him a, 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 nut, a nut job, a, a liar. Uh, but, you know, proof is in the pudding. All those guys ever did was judge people, lay the burdens of the world on their shoulders, and never help them a bit. Never help them a bit. And so what Jesus is saying here, in Matthew 11.30, he says, For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So we're, we're set free from this heavy burden of sin. That's a burden, man, on your shoulder. And once you, once you get that picture, once you see Christ, once you accept Jesus Christ, you have a place to take that burden, that heavy load, and it's to him. And he asks you to do that. And he tells you his burden is light. And when we're set free of the burden of sin, we can love God and love one another. And that burden is light. So what kind of burdens do you carry? It's a question. good question. Um, some of them are simple, you know. Some people are, carry the fear, fear of war, fear of war, man, I... I, I got to tell you, when I was uh, when I was in the seventh grade, they were um, they had the Cuban blockade. I was in the seventh grade, happened to be in my history class, and 
you know, my, my teacher, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't just give us the story uh, passively and, you know, try to sugarcoat it. He was telling us, man, well, hey, one of those bombs is going to disintegrate all of us. If you bomb, throw a bomb over here and a bomb over here, hey, we're history. And so he's not just talking about that. He's putting the fear of war and the fear of what could happen in, in our minds. Seventh, seventh grade, I think I was 12, 12 years old. Man, that stuck with me for a long time. Man, there was times I had nightmares because my history teacher was telling me and describing it to us what that war is. And we were in the middle of that blockade. We didn't know if Russia was going to back down, but it all worked out. It all worked out. But that was a, that was a burden that I carried. That was, a, that was a fear of war. Some people have a fear of disease. And, and now with COVID, um, that, that's a concern. It should be a concern, but not a fear. I mean, I, the only thing I'm really concerned about is, is my daughter, because she had it bad. I would not want to take it home to her. So besides that, um, leaning, leaning on the Lord takes away those fears. That burden is taken off your shoulders. There are people that fear being homeless for a good reason. There's a lot of homeless people. People that are fear of being alone near the end of their life. I'm alone. I don't have anybody with me. And that's also a fear. Fear that your government can no longer protect you. Guess what? We're right there now and no longer protect you. This world that we live in has placed a heavy burden on all of us. Where do we, where do we go to unload these? A lot of people go to the bottle. Uh, drugs. They go to a shrink. Well, psychologists, I, I call them shrink for short, but Suicide. Uh, so God's asking you to bring your burdens to him. Bring your worries to him. When you get down on your knees and you pray, you know that those prayers are being answered. And we're going to get to that in a few minutes, but you know your prayers are being answered. And you know that they're being answered in God's will. And God's will will always be that you are protected. Your spiritual life is protected when you're walking with him. Your physical life, that went out the window when uh, Adam and Eve chose to eat the quince or the apple or whatever, whatever it was. Um, so we all have that original sin. But as a Christian, as a born-again Christian, we can come to the Lord with our, our sins and our burdens and lay them at his feet. And they're taken care of. Verse 5. It's a rhetorical question. Who's the one who overcomes the world? Well, the answer really is no one. No one. No one can overcome the world except this exception, those who trust in Jesus Christ. Remember, he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father except through him. So John's continually pressing the identity of Jesus. You know, he's He's not just saying that he's a great teacher. You know, I, man, I heard that. It was one of the stupidest remarks uh, that I can remember when, when I was teaching in high school and, you know, one of the other teachers would say, you know, you know, Lefty, you know, believing in God is, you know, supernatural stuff. Uh, well, Jesus was real. They go, well, yeah, he was a real, he was a good teacher. Well, if you're going to call him a teacher, let's be honest, he was a great teacher. He was the best teacher. In fact, today's modern teaching methods that, uh, that has surfaced within the last 30 years, maybe 20 years, on uh, how, to, how to teach without just giving you the answer, but drawing the answer out of you. Who do you think invented that? Jesus was great at asking a, answering a question with a question answering a question with a question. So yes, he was a great teacher. Um, and he, he was a prophet. Yes, he was a prophet. Um, 
Or he was even the Messiah. People could say, yeah, he, he, that guy, he was the Messiah. And so he's constantly identifying Jesus with God because even though he was all those things, Jesus was with God the Father as God's Son and who shares that divine nature. So he's not just those things that, those names that the world tagged on him. He's more than that. He's the Son of God. He's part, he's part of the Trinity. Uh, without him, there is no life. So when we talk about Jesus, we need to remember that it's, he's not just a great teacher, and, and it's our faith that helps us overcome this world. And it's only, it's only through Jesus Christ. So without faith in Christ, no one's able to face down evil. If you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, he's not part of your life. You can't face the hopelessness that's out there today. There's People, open your eyes and look around. It's a hopeless world right now. And um, self-defeat uh, is spread around the world on a day-by-day -day basis. I, I, for one, don't really look at the, the news anymore. I don't search for uh, this country, fighting this country. I don't, you know, I, I, I pray when I pray. I pray for God's will to be done because uh, we can all pray for peace. Not happening. We can all pray for, you know, money. Not happening. Um, if you're a true Christian, you're not going to pray for that anyway. You can only pray for what you need, not what you want. And he's going to give you what you need. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right there. And then next week... Uh, we'll pick up from verses 6 to verse 12, and we'll go from there. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for the first five verses of chapter 5 in 1 John. And Lord, we just ask you to and thank you that we, we can, through Christ, be overcomers of this world. We are the over, overcomers through him. And there's a lot to overcome, Lord. There's a lot to overcome. And with your strength and your guidance, we we'll overcome. So just bless this day, bless this week. Until next week, Lord, um, help, help all of us to diligently open the scriptures and read and to learn and have faith in you. We ask this in your name. Amen.